talking about um, stuff or actual archaeological objects, but bear with me, it will all be okay. <laughs> um, I'm going to be talking about the um, archiving of publications and born digital material, but I will not get techie or geeky, I promise. If you want me to do that, find me afterwards. Um, I work uh, at the Society of Antiquaries of Scotland, um, I'm the manager for the SCARF project, but the Antiquaries are one of the um, oldest antiquarian or learned societies in Europe. Um, we were founded, oh, should probably start the slide here. There we go. Uh, we were founded in 1780 when folk looked like this. Um, and uh, our purpose was at that time to investigate antiquities, it wasn't specifically archaeology. Um, but it was basically a way for people, rich people, who went on the grand tour and plundered artifacts to kind of legitimise what they were doing back home in Scotland. Um, obviously the society was founded at the time of the Enlightenment um, and I put this in not for patriotic reasons but because we just had the Edinburgh Festival, Book Festival, um, and Voltaire was quoted, we looked to Scotland for all ideas of civilization. and I thought that was quite nice. Um, so the society, uh, the people, the objects that the people brought back to the society started to get a bit much to have in the society's office at the time, people's front rooms, um, they founded a museum. Um, and our members, who included uh, people like Sir Walter Scott, uh, collected all this stuff and this formed the basis of the collections of what is now the National Museum of Scotland in Edinburgh. That's what it looked like back then. This is what it looks like now if you want to come and visit. Um, the society, for those of you who don't know, one of the main things that we do is publications. Um, we support the enjoyment of Scotland's past, if you will, um, through um, the publication annually of what are called the Proceedings um, of the Society of Antiquaries of Scotland, hereafter referred to as PSAS. Um, we publish one of those a year, and we have published those since 1783. We also publish about six to eight books a year, or monograph type things. Um, these are all real physical books that exist, but we also have an online journal. Um, Scottish Archaeological Internet Report. What goes in there, obviously the online has been published since 1982, but we have been publishing. Um, the online reports tend to be large scale excavation surveys, gazetteers, conference proceedings, um, things that are too big, complicated, expensive, have too many pictures, um, or are just full of tables, it wouldn't make a good traditional proceedings, but go quite nicely online. Um, we have been publishing something since 1792, um, not even the war that made all those lovely photos could stop us publishing, uh, we love it. Um, <laughs> our fellows, people that are members of the society, uh, they love books. This will, this will become part of the work. These are our fellows, we are so that we've seen it. Um, the society is a membership organisation, so uh, we are a government body, we're not funded like that, we're funded by people who love archaeology and heritage and pay annually to, to join. One of the main benefits many of our fellows would say of this fellowship is that you get a copy of the proceedings every year. You get one of these lovely brown books um, through the post, straight to your home or office or whatever. Um, we also send hundreds of copies to libraries and institutions across the world. We have a lot of reciprocal agreements with um, not just university libraries across the world, but also small regional libraries and things. So our, our reach of the proceedings is, is very wide. Um, but as you can imagine, even if you have a few years of these proceedings, you're going to fill up your bookshelves very quickly. Um, all this knowledge of lovely Scottish archaeology, and the proceedings are obviously mostly Scottish archaeology, will take up lots of precious space. Um, it looks really smart. It's an impressive library, it's an impressive shelf to have. And it, gives, it does give you a certain amount of gravitas. Um, but bad news if any films are in the audience, the days of the hard copy proceedings are numbered. Um, 
the, the next issue of the proceedings will be the last that we send to our fellows in traditional print form. Um, libraries and institutions will still receive it, but fellows must opt in, otherwise they will get a digital version only. Um, this is a bold move. Um, Star Trek bold. There are some who are thinking we're messing with an institution that's not broken, so why are we changing it? Well, I probably don't have to tell most of you, and someone's already brought this up, it's cost, it's money. Um, this probably doesn't come as a surprise to people involved in archives, somebody already mentioned, or publications, certainly. Um, the rising cost for heritage publications is, is getting a bit silly, frankly. Um, going paperless will save us about 30 to 40,000 pounds a year. Um, and this is money that we intend on putting back into, some of it will go back into publications, but quite a substantial amount of that will go back into funding archaeological research in Scotland, like actual archaeology. Um, and well, I, should, I should say, sorry, the society doesn't just do archaeology, it's historical things as well, but however you look at it, £30,000 a year is a lot of money to be spending on something that isn't a book, that to be honest, most people use to prop up monitors or open doors if it's not on a shelf. Um, so, the move to having born digital proceedings doesn't come out of anywhere. In fact, about 15 years ago, I don't know why I animated this, who knows, uh, in 2001, we began scanning the archive of our proceedings, um, and it's available online for free through the Archaeology Data Service website. Um, I'm not going to assume that most people know what that is, but it's a trusted digital repository in England, they hold an amazing resource of loads of things, go and, go and look. But for the purposes of this, they hold digital versions of our proceedings, um, apart from the last year, which you have to be fulfilled to access. Um, having our archives online brings our publication to a much wider audience than sending hefty book books through the post ever could. Um, we know, for example, that since 2011, when, when the figures began, records began, as they like to say, um, users have downloaded articles from PSAS more than 400,000 times. Um, so when you go to the ADS website, uh, you go to the year that you like, each uh, proceedings, is, each article is available as a PDF for free. Um, and I mean, you wouldn't get 400,000 people asking for our books. You know, our print run is about 4,000. This is amazing. It's amazing opening up of our data, of hundreds of years of data. The Archaeology Data Service also hosts um, the full text of our out-of-print monographs that I showed earlier and the Scottish Archaeological Internet Reports, which I mentioned are longer than proceedings and can be up to sort of 50,000 words. Why am I in this session? Well, this should become apparent. Um, it can be seen then that the sheer amount of knowledge our publications represent makes an indispensable resource for anyone studying either archaeology in Scotland, but also things like the history of antiquarianism or the history of trains of thought and theory, um, as well as a treasure trove of information on actual archaeological sites and artefacts. These publications cover hundreds of years of research, thousands of different objects and sites, and hundreds of authors. And their single common link is often linked to society itself. For example, this is an Iron Age dagger from a site in Scotland. This is some Gothic architecture in Scotland. And these are some miniature bagpipes, because I thought, why not? Um, there's, no, there's nothing that links these things at all, archaeologically, historically. If someone can, or buy your paint, because actually the only thing that links them is the fact that the society has published things about them. Um, if this was a pub quiz, the society would be answering what no one would get. So how then can we in the society best use our own heritage and archives, which after all describe these things, to inform future work. Uh, this is the National Museum of Scotland, just to look at while I got around for a bit more. Uh, the call for papers for this stated that it has been common practice to separate documents and artifact collections when archiving, when they should in fact be included in the archives together as equally important archaeological data. This is exactly our problem. We have been meticulous in preserving copies of our proceedings, copies of the nice books, both as books on the shelf and as digital copies. But the artefacts mentioned in these works, the dagger, the mini bagpipes, etc., um, these things used to belong to society, for example. Uh, artefacts haven't fared so well. To go back to the dagger, um, although I think I did, um, I tried to track it down in the museum. The dagger's mentioned in the proceedings, there's a, like, 
three pages about this dagger and where it was found and who found it and, and, and what it might mean and be, which archaeologically iffy, but it is antiquarian. Um, I can't track the dagger down. The dagger is presumably in the National Museum because it was part of our collections, as I mentioned earlier. Um, but we gave our collections away to the people of Scotland. Um, we gifted our collections to the government because basically the society, like a small independent organisation, couldn't look after our archive collections anymore. So we gave it to the museum. So the dagger of Lincoln Tree Indiana Jones picture <laughs> is in there somewhere. No doubt someone in the museum could find it for me. But it seems really silly to have an object and the history of the object's documentation, etc., separated when they should be together. Um, it's really easy to find out that the dagger exists and the history of the object, but not the object itself. These things probably should be linked together, but the museum database doesn't contain links to things, publications about the object. Um, our half of the puzzle, the documentation on these objects, how they were acquired, early studies of them, antiquarian access, these are freely available and easily accessible, but not the objects themselves. Arguably, by keeping our archive of proceedings available, we're enhancing the value of the artifacts themselves. I'm running out of time. So I um, managed the SCARF project, which is one of the research projects of the society. This is also uh, freely available online, um, online only. It contains a potted history of all of Scotland's archaeology, Find me after, that's how you get to it. Um, but basically, we split up the history of Scotland into nine panels, seven archaeological ones, and science and maritime as overarching themes. These are some statistics. It took a lot of people and a lot of hours to make each of these panel reports. They're freely available online, and the important thing about them is that they're written by the experts in their field, they're peer-reviewed, and they contain a set of research questions for every period, so from Neolithic, Medieval, whatever is your thing, there is a set of clearly defined research questions. Um, this is supposed to be an archaeologist, you make this kind of archive, you're a specialist to help you. The questions that these kind of people have about Scottish archaeology are recorded in these online publications, um, but how do we preserve the questions themselves? Um, we're in the process at the moment of updating these panel reports to check if these questions are still relevant, what questions can be added, um, making sure our current archaeology is still current. Um, there's planned in the future that these new reports will contain more links to the data that made them. This is where I won't get you here, I promise. Um, but the, the archives and the data that made these reports, if we make these things kind of available online like this, they'll only be a useful addition if they're openly accessible and the links are maintained. Otherwise, we'll end up <sighs> being as accessible as just trying to find books, I think. Uh, wait. So, having open data and openly accessible publications leads to new and current archaeology. It leads to field schools in Scotland, research projects in Scotland, and even PhDs um, based on our research recommendations that we have openly available online. How do we remain relevant? The society is quite privileged in that we have been around since 1790 and it's doubtful that we're going anywhere because we're not related to anything in danger. So as long as we have people interested in the heritage and history of Scotland, we will remain around. So how are we? We're in a good place to see where, you know, we're not going away. We need to make sure our things and our archives and things don't go away. How can we ensure our rich history will remain relevant for as long as they are needed? And very quickly, very quickly, I promise, um, you are like getting your world exclusive. Um, one of the projects we're working on just now is going to be called the Smelly Collection. <laughs> it's quite funny. You can get over it once you realise that this guy, William Smelly, was the creator of the first ever Encyclopedia Britannica. He was the Society of Antiquaries Superintendent of Natural History when the museum started and wrote the philosophy of natural history. We have a project at the moment named after him. Uh, to open up and digitise more of our archaeological resources. Archives that at the moment are clo closed in a book, we want to make them accessible to people. This is a book by Richard Bradley. I've not, um, we've got plans to make the text available online, fully searchable. It will have links to Canmore, which I don't think to know, but is the Historic Environment in Scotland Royal Commission uh, Bible of Archaeological Interventions in Scotland. Um, we want to be part of the directory of open access journals so people can come to our archives that way. We want to have 
maps have been talked about quite a lot in a better way than I can at the moment. We want to link maps to all our things, we want to have Orthos ORCID IDs, and we want people to be able to look at green statistics openly so they can see that our current research is making an impact. I'm going to skip all this to the end, as I can see that sign. Um, in summary, I just wanted to say that, that although it appears that publications are not traditional archives we should be thinking about opening up and sharing, that it, to think of objects, archaeological objects and publications as separate is perhaps a bad move. And by thinking of them together, um, it will open up the information they contain a lot more. So, thank you.